Okay. Um, yeah, it's, I think the gradual moving into and realization of these different modes of dialogue is something that's very, very interesting. And I know mm -hmm. it's something that is fascinating you at the moment. And I see it tying in deeply to the series Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, and particularly, of course, the sort of response aspect of how we come to terms with and ultimately move through, ameliorate, as you put it, the perennial problems we face. Mm -hmm. um, and dialogue is one of many modes of expression, experience, response that we might take to these perennial problems and and um i was trying to i'm trying to feel back in and sort of drop into where where we are now hmm. Hmm. yeah I've, I've been engaging with your series a lot the last few days and oh, thank you. Yeah, I've actually been listening to you on occasion double time. So I'm hoping that this conversation <laughs> will be a little bit easier for me to follow along. It's funny when you, when, you, when you flip back from double time to single, I'm like, oh, it feels so slow for a few seconds. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. But, um, but it's the double time was, was literally just to get through some things. I thought I'm, I need to make sure that there aren't key pieces I'm missing out on here before we sort of speak. Mm. Uh, and I definitely prefer the, the single time version of it. And you know, John, it's it's um, it's a challenging thing, and this might bring us to a point of sort of art articulating some of the productive nature of dialogue, but also the conditions which sort of have to be present to engage in it. Because what I'm feeling right now, just to speak on my state, is a mixture of. Uh, extreme gratitude for the opportunity to dialogue with you i'm Thank also you. feeling the the tremendous breadth of the whole series and an interest to speak to that dynamic and context so that we've got as much as we possibly can have on the table between us so that mm. we can in some sense both together orient towards what might be of sort of mutual interest to explore and so much of what you explore I find deeply important and and crucial for me personally to gain further insight and familiarity with so that I can in collaboration with others build the kinds of communities and ultimately um, experiences that facilitate some of this deep development that is part and parcel of meeting and responding to the meaning crisis. And so there's all of this breadth. And then there's at the same time, when it comes to dialogue, a certain sense of a certain sense of safety and smoothness and being just where we are. And, mm -hmm. and so in some meta way, I, this is me, I suppose, expressing to you a little bit of where I am, which is um, gradually feeling into a way in here. And so if I draw into a, a question, hmm. Hmm. Where do you feel this notion of dialogue? It's, it's a Socratic dialogue, but there's also, I sense a bit more of an intimacy to mm -hmm. what you're exploring. Could you, could you articulate how that is alive for you at the moment and how you feel that this may be a, an important practice to situate within our ecology of ways we can develop and ameliorate and move through some of the perennial problems we face as existential beings? Oh, great. I think that's an excellent question. Before I address the question, I first want to respond. Mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciated your careful, and I mean that in a very positive sense, your very careful articulation of how you're framing, the framing you're bringing to bear into this interaction. I thought that was very, uh, 
a very helpful thing uh, for me, and I think also very, uh, very helpful for potential listeners. So I just wanted to say thank you for doing that. I think taking the time, that's, in my mind, that's analogous to the importance I give to problem formulation. It's kind of like dialogue formulation. How are we formulating the dialogue before we immediately le leap in and try to solve or resolve or whatever we're going to do in the dialogue? Spending that time to first formulate the dialogue, explicate it, make sure that we share, we have a shared commitment to this formulation. Um, so I think that, right, I think that's an exemplary thing you just did. Uh, so I want to commend you on that. I want to express my appreciation for that in both senses of the word, like the gratitude and the understanding uh, for, for why you did that. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and that, of course, is a nice segue into uh, your, your, your question, the question that you actually posed to me. Uh, <coughs> so a, a bit of the genealogy of how it emerged and, and, the, and will give me a way of getting a little bit uh, better uh, where it's at. Um, so I've been, I mean, in conjunction with the awakening from the meaning crisis, um, of course, I've been talking a lot about this need for an ecology of practice, ecology of practices, um, you know, setting up uh, counterbalancing, self-organizing systems of psychotech um, in order to, as you say, ameliorate uh, the perennial problems and perhaps also enhance and afford increased sense of senses of connection to oneself, to other people, to the world, all of that. Um, and I was in, I want to, uh, uh, another motive for this is to also give uh, appropriate credit. And, it, and it's not just a moral thing I'm doing. I'm trying to also show the role, the vital role of distributed cognition in the work we're doing that often gets masked by a kind of uh, individualistic ideology that I want to challenge not only what I'm saying, but in what I'm exemplifying. So mm. I was in one of these kinds of discussions with somebody who I've, uh, who's, who, uh, who I've come to have a, a lot of affection for and deep appreciation for, um, Jordan Hall. Uh, Jordan is especially important for the manner in which he converses. I'm not saying he doesn't have great ideas. He does. He has great insights. But people tend to focus a little too rapidly on content and not pay enough attention to the way he's doing all this really important work again around uh, the manner and the formulation of the dialogue. So I was in discussion with him and I was trying to get at his notion of coherence, We're comparing it. And he had this insight. He said, well, what I think I'm pointing towards is the need for a, a meta psychotechnology whose role it is, is to help generate, curate and organize the, the, the ecology of psychotechnology. So I use this sort of metaphor of shepherding. We need something that shepherds it. And I thought, and I, that just struck me as, oh, wow, that's a, that's sort of, that's a brilliant insight. And it was in my mind, there's a relationship between how individuals cultivate wisdom and, you know, and then, right, the, the, this needed meta psychotechnology. So then I, I, I got thinking and then I realized that the ancient world had something deeply analogous to this, which was the practice of dialectic, which came out of Socratic and Linkus, and it ramifies through Plato, and then it goes in all kinds of important directions in the Neoplatonic uh, tradition. Now, the thing about dialectic, and if you read the Neoplatonists, it's very clear that it had this status of being a meta-psychotechnology. It is sort of the meta-practice you do so you know how to best do the other practices and curate and coordinate them together. And the interesting thing about the dialectic is it, 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 it's both something you do as an individual, sort of ontologically, and then something you do with other people uh, discursively, and that these, uh, these two dimensions are integrated in a powerful way. So while well, I was saying, oh, well, I should, uh, I should better understand that because that would serve as a valuable template for trying to understand what, what Jordan was talking about. And, that, and, and, it, and it was, of course, deeply enmeshed with the Wisdom Project, which was the connection I was seeking. So then I thought, oh, that's really interesting because that also ties in with this stuff that's also been happening. You can see it, for example, on Rebel Wisdom, about the rediscovery of the power of the collective intelligence that is generated by distributed cognition. And you know, there's now some, you know, even some hard science and it's a little bit some of it's ghastly about the power of distributed cognition um like they've directly linked brain uh, rat brains together and 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 that collectivity can solve problems that individual rats can't solve the computational powering right um and then there's all the stuff about the brain synchrony between human beings i won't get into the nuts and bolts of it so there's all this emerging stuff and then 
I thought, oh, and then I, I and then I got to meet somebody else who I'm forming a, a very deep friendship with. You just talked to him, Guy Senstock. And you know, and the so there's all these emerging uh psychotechnologies, and especially guys circling, because guys circling is so impregnated with the wisdom project of Heideggerian and existential philosophy that it's it's exactly the kind of thing, right? Uh, I'm I'm talking about as is something that has analogous elements with ancient dialectics. So I've been I've been engaging with the help of Peter Lindbergh at um, and the, the wonderful people in, in my circling groups. So I'm doing participant observation, learning some of these other uh, discourse uh, uh, modalities. Uh, did some uh, empathy circling uh, recently, uploaded that video, doing some insight, di- learn, going to do some insight dialogue. Anyways, learning all of these things. And so it struck me that dialectic was also the machinery in the ancient world by which people were tailoring themselves to and entering into right? The collective intelligence of distributed cognition. And they often spoke of this in religious terms. Um, What's really interesting to me when I'm in the circling practice, for example, is how spontaneously people, often from a very secular orientation, will, will, will will find themselves using very spiritual, even religious terms to talk about the phenomenology and the change in functionality that's occurring in these practices. So I just saw that as a, a massive convergence. I saw, okay, here's all this stuff going on about the collective intelligence of distributed cognition. Here's ancient dialectic, and there's all these new and wonderful texts being generated around this, like Sarah, Sarah uh, Rappe's book on Socrates, for example, is just amazing. And then, right, and there's that coordination with Jordan's idea about the meta psychotechnology. And, and then, there, like I said, it, it struck me that, well, what we could do is we could and that's what I'm going to do in the next series. We could explore right now all these current emerging dialogical practices, put that into dialogue, and I don't mean that as a pun, I mean that as a real thing, put that into dialogue with what I can get, what I can get glean from and garner for the practice of ancient dialectic, and see if we can then bring you know, some elucidation, some clarification, some insight, some advancement of the project. Because Here's, here's, the, here's the key idea. Just like individual intelligence needs to be exapted up into rationality and then that exapted up into wisdom, we need to take collective intelligence and ratchet that up into collective rationality and in connective wisdom, collective wisdom. And those two projects are deeply interpenetrating. And so that's what I think we need in order to get to uh, the metapsychotechnology. So I'm doing a lot of work with Christopher Master Pietro. By the way, you should have him on your... You should, you should interview Chris, right? Um, I, so Chris and I are writing a, a chapter for the Meta Modern Anthology on just the stuff you were talking about. It's also going into um, the, the book we're working on. So, there, so I'm doing a lot of work with Chris right now to try and uh, nail down some of the theory. I'm doing a lot of work with Peter on, on the period of Lindbergh, investi- investigating it with, through this participant observation, reading the literature together. So... Um, there's a lot of people, we're all working together. Um, some of them I get to work with directly in collaboration. Some of it's more of a network that I'm uh, contributing to, to try and I think, get this. I know that Guy, for example, is extremely excited. He texted me the other day. He said he wanted to, he want, he's really excited to do Circling 2.0 because he wants to try and incorporate all of this stuff in, uh, into Circling that I, I'm talking to you about. So that's, that's why I'm sort of, I'm getting very excited right now because there's a lot of excitement. I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of real potential here uh, to, uh, to 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 create, to cultivate, to help it, um, advance this kind of meta psychotechnology and access ultimately collective rationality and collective wisdom, so that we have something that can really vet our attempts to create the ecology of practices that are needed to address and ameliorate the meaning crisis. So that's sort of a gist of, and, and, and I, I ask for forbearance uh, from all your listeners and your viewers, because this is very much a work in progress. This is st- something I'm, you know, I'm doing work on now, trying to get the, the phenomenology and the functionality of all of this worked out. Um, but this is where, this is where it's at right now. Oh yeah. Beautiful, John. Thank you so much for that answer. That was, that was, that was excellent. Hmm. It's very exciting. I, I feel that same sense of, of interest and excitement about it. And 
we'll continue to be gathering with people here, both in person, online, and then around the world in person eventually when I get off and away from here for just a little bit, um, to be doing exactly that. It's some attempt to move into insight practice in a co-participatory way. This, mm-hmm. this, mm-hmm. this movement towards presencing wisdom about that ultimately, which in some sense we are already bringing to bear and presencing in our own lives to get by in the world, this set of psycho technologies that are already in play, the ones that are already emerging. So is it is it a fair formulation to think about a meta psycho technology as the um, continual renewal or establishment and renewal of co-participatory wisdom? Oh, I think that's an excellent way of putting it. I think it's 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 participatory in both. If you'll allow me, the metaphor is horizontal between people and vertical within uh, a person, because there's a sense if we, if this if, it, if this machinery isn't already to some degree active in you, you need it to start to get into it. It's like a virtue. If you it's like you need right, you need a bit of honesty to cultivate more of honesty and, and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. You need that germinating spark kind of idea. Um, so I think you ultimately only know this kind of wisdom by participating in it. And then, like you said, it's very much also, and this is what, this is what has such some of the most powerful phenomenological effects on people, that sense of, well, that's, that's why it's often called the we space, the participation in some, right, some emerging, uh, emergent thing, emergent presence. I, I, I got to be careful here with my language because I don't want to invoke you know, weird, a weird metaphysics, but you, you get this, you get this we space that is not reducible to any one particular uh, individual cognition. And so, and your relationship to it, one is one of participation. It's not other than you, but it's not identical to you. You participate in it. Yes. Um, and, and it's, and I mean, and, and again, that's why it, it harkens back to uh, you know, uh, sort of theurgic language. It's, I mean, and it even survives in some of our metaphors. We talk about team spirit. Well, at one point, that was really a phenomenological thing. It wasn't just sort of yaho, right? It was a, and right. So when you're when you're doing something like circling, you get you get that, but it's not just a metaphor for our shared commitment. It's the there's almost like a synesthetic experience of you know uh, of the dynamical system that has taken shape between. Uh, all the people involved and 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 the, and sort of the the power it has to alter and shift individual uh, uh, cognition uh, so um, yeah I think that 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 it's so it's deeply participatory in both within you you have to re, you, like you you have to be it you can't just think about it you have to embody it um, and then it's also deeply participatory in that you have this relationship to the we space all right the, the that is again it's not it's not other and it's not me it's not i it's it's we so it's deeply it's it's phenomenology is inherently participatory in nature Mm. and then as you said what that's all directed towards and what i want to even more directed towards with the help of people like jordan and guy and chris is as you said towards the individual and collective uh cultivation of wisdom so that's why there's the subtitle so the ser- the next series is after socrates uh, the the pursuit of wisdom through authentic dialogue mm. yeah yeah that's that that all seems right to me hmm. so i wonder if this is an interesting way in because <clears throat> okay okay so so in one sense, it seems like where we are to go in dialogue, which neither of us know right now, mm-hmm. is in some sense, is some sense emergent. And in another sense, it's latent already in each of us individually, our current maps of making sense of things, and also our orientation and way we are willing to be that and show up and embody that, right, to be mm-hmm. continuous between that propositional and participatory level and to the extent we can generate the perspectival knowing so we can both participate in that to the extent I have the words right to procedurally be able to do that as well we are we are here at this opening and I'd like to I'd like to presence a little bit about where I feel myself 
ultimately going and that doesn't mean we have to go there right now there's this there's this balance so there's this balance mm -hmm. that's important to hold isn't it between the being where well, being where we are and being and ultimately actually my my fundamental goal here is to be helpful in a collaborative way towards that very project and and i would actually love to talk to you about how that project relates to a lot of how I am driven to show up in the world. And broadly speaking, these collaborations toward the creation of communities that enable wisdom, enable the development of uh, psychotechnologies and the practicing of different psychotechnologies based on the sovereign choice of individuals to move towards that in their life and to realize a deeper connection to themselves, each other and the world. While we also make sense of where we're at in our collective moment, for me, this is absolutely essential. and serving that is what my primary aim is yet that is it that is something that's it's a life project and then we have the moment of this conversation and i have my own yes, yes, individual yeah. places of where i'm at with considering for example some of the deeper metaphysical um, aspects to your theorizing because your theorizing has been so important to me or a key influence of mine because I mean, for many beautiful ways that it's we don't have time to talk about it precisely today and so there's all of these aspects of myself that in some sense are desiring to presence themselves yet there is a thread that if i tend to it is also one that can be between us that is mutually yeah. interesting yeah. and revelatory for both of us I think what you're doing right now is is already extremely helpful. So the interesting one of the interesting dimensions I call it the theoria theory dimension. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're doing in this practice is we're constantly moving, uh, uh, right? And it's a, it's a matter of the way in which attention and perspectival knowing are shifting, right? But we're constantly moving between uh, theory in which we advance propositional arguments, right? Uh, and then, but then, then we do what you just did. We step back into theoria, which is we step back into a, a, a contemplative frame in which we're again, okay, where are we? What's the agent arena, you know, set up here? How are we formulating the dialogue? And then what we're doing there is we're trying to come alive to, we're trying to increase our sensitivity and transform our sensibility so we can sense the Kairos, so we can sense like the way in which this is shifting and directing. And there's so much finesse here. I, I talk about it almost like there's the musicality and you're trying to get the rhythm. You're trying to sense the tone. And so you have to, you have to constantly shift into theoria to sense. And also you're, but it, it's, not, it's not just a sensing thing. There's an aspiration thing. You're also, you're also training your sensibility, like music appreciation. So you're doing this sensing and transforming your sensibility to pick up on the musicality uh, uh, of the dialogue so that when you come back in, it's not just you and the other person. Both of you like, are sharing this commitment to what's emerging between you. So first of all, I think what you just did about, right, and, and so I think, I think this is a vital, and I'm using that word to try and resonate with as many meanings as possible with it. I think what you just did is a, a, a vital thing, that, that theory, theoria shift, and I was talking to Jordan about this, how it's seen, and, and, and about how it's about sensitizing, but also transforming sensibility to pick up on the musicality. I think that that's just, like, I, I think that's actually I, that's vital to what we're trying to do here uh, right now. And it's important, therefore, um, it, for people who are interested in what we're talking about, to pay attention to this exemplification and not just uh, the the explicit uh, content of our propositions. So I think yes. that that was a very that was a very that 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 for me that see that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in right now. I'm trying to get at like what's in practice. What's the transformations of the phenomenology that tell us something about how to access and transform the func underlying functionality? And, and so just here, just now, you, you doing that, and the fact that you did it uh, so spontaneously and so well is an exact, exactly the kind of thing um, that I'm very interested in. And, and I think is, as I say, vital to trying to, uh, to get this. And, the idea, and even the metaphor that you had of the thread is so good because, right, there's a sense in which, you know, you, ha you have to, you know, to really play with salience to in, in the midst of all the other things to find the thread and the, and then there's a kind of diligence and a respect uh that you have to set yourself into to, to follow the thread um so yes i think all of that is important 
Um, and here's a, another word I want to use with as much resonance as possible. It's important to invoke all of this um, on a regular and reliable basis rather than simply referring to it. Mm. Yes. 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 There's a sense in which... So I'm... Let me see if I can use the term theoria here a little bit in practice so that I can further get it. It's not every day that conversations are available to use the word theoria in. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so... Well, so this is a different way in. There's a... there's a, a movement towards an sort of an unscripted mode because there is this necessity i feel the language is appropriate i feel to to presence actually gently as we um have almost an opponent processing towards yep. it yes um we have an opponent processing towards the appropriate place of vulnerability and that vulnerability is more mm. but the vulnerability is involved and that vulnerability from me in this moment especially when we are skimming along the surface of what are deep metaphysical cogs and yes, highly yes. developed ontologies and, and epistemologies these are the kinds of the vulnerabilities that can, in fact, as you speak about so interestingly in one of your lecture episodes, invoke a sense of horror if they are um, yep. misplayed or if they are dislodged without the right bounds of safety. And I'm very attuned to this. And I, and I actually have considerable experience in deep metaphysical unsettling and epistemological mm -hmm. and ontological unsettling over the course of many years and in that sense i feel ready to be here and do this but there's a sense in which when i'm talking about this stuff i i realize how affectively laden i am looking to presence my words and it's the affective component that you also speak about an awful lot as being a key characterization of how we should understand relevance realization oh totally um, i mean it's the the coping of relevance realization is inseparably bound up with a, a primordial kind of caring. Yes, yes beautiful uh. caring. It's it's precisely that. And for me, I was using the language of an affective relation uh, before I became so acquainted with your work to express to myself that there was some important contrast between an intellectual way of going at the world mm -hmm. and that, in some sense, mm -hmm. our frames were always and already filtered to some degree by something like. And, you know, I was influenced a lot by your thinking before I came to study you a lot because I had engaged with it a little bit. And the term, rele the term relevance realization is itself, it, it reveals, you know, the more, the more you understand of it, the more you can grok the whole just through appreciating the terms. It, I think it's very, oh, very appropriate. It's a very, very We're appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, choosing the right terms is a very important thing to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's something actually that, I think can be afforded like dialogue can help i think spontaneously to generate those terms but it could also be not precisely the place where you look for them and i know this in my own experience because so often i'm looking to communicate the aff affective component to to enable this sense of shared mm. safety and care so i will go at expressing things in all these different ways coming at it this like this like this with these different emotional tones behind it, but right, that's not right, how right. I would sit down to write something if I wanted to make something analytically tight in the way that relevance realization has to be analytically tight for it to play that mm -hmm. role between the cognitive science on the one hand and then also the religio you're on right, the other. Right, right. Yeah, okay. but, so yeah, I, I think I I, uh, uh, I, uh, I wanted to intervene because you made a couple of really excellent points. I, did, I didn't want I didn't want them to uh, to be left. left. Uh, one. The, the, the thing you just said, uh, I think there's, yeah, I think, and, and there's a big difference between theorizing, which I think we need to do, and that is where you need those precise terms, and you shouldn't produce until you've come to precision. Yes, I agree with that, um, and, and that is the appropriate place to do that. But I think to go back to two points you made about dialogos, and I try to use the Greek now by way of the logos, because the logos 
right, is, is much more comprehensive than logic, right? It's, it's the gathering together so that things belong together. So, but in Dialogos, there's two things you said that are very important. First, we're putting ourselves on the edge of, we're putting ourselves into a system that's dynamical and, and, and that is going to have emergent features. The, the ongoing emergence of what we have not pre-planned or pre-packaged or pre-cognized, pre-thought, right, is, is again, a vital piece of it. Next, you mentioned about the affectivity and you mentioned the vulnerability. And, and there's a way in which I'm, I'm sort of seeing these coming together. Because I was really, uh, I, I really liked what you, when you and Guy were talking about the, uh, with the distinction between vulnerability and exposure uh, that had come up. Um, Guy and I talked a bit about that, and then I think he talked to, uh, at length with Jordan about that. Because um, it's, it's this notion, again, of sensitization, right? There's the difference, when you're exposed, right, what the, 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 you actually, what the, the response is, to, is, a, is a hardening, right? The response is a, a hardening, and because what you're trying to do is defend and protect yourself from further incursion. But in vulnerability, if we're using it as distinct from exposure, because of course people use terms in all kinds of sloppy ways, but if we're using it in, in the distinction, vulnerability is a kind of sensitization. You're allowing yourself to, to things to penetrate into you. So it comes with that sensitivity. And I think that's exactly where the affective component has to be our guide, because what our affect is often doing is giving us the degree to which our our ability to perceive and sense is 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 threatening, or the degree to which it's nourishing. Our affect is often, you know, deeply attuned to okay, what it, what it, what is this doing? And so, I think being able to coordinate, you know, courage and care with vulnerability is what affords it to be actually become that sensitivity. Um, and so, a, a lot of what we are doing is. And again, to try and you know really make this word resonate with people, we're trying to encourage each other. Uh, and, and, and if you'll allow me to coin a new word, we're trying to encare each other. We're trying to create right caring between and within each other, so that we can uh, th that the vulnerability stays at, at become it stays as a sensitivity and doesn't harden into uh, a, a defensive framing of oh I, I'm overexposed. And then that. Th that, in turn, uh, you know, le leads me back to uh, the point you made ab about, and this is this is one I, uh, I hope we can spend some time on because it's 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 kind of the the, the 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 tangled but really juicy part, <laughs> if I can put mm -hmm. it that way, which is mm -hmm. we need. We're not, we, we need a place for theorizing. Let's put that aside. I've already acknowledged that, and I do that, and that's important. And people know that I care about that. So I'm going to take it that that's a given, that it, 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 nothing that we're doing here challenges any of that or undermines it in any way. But when we're doing dialogos, right, we do need to bring into it the depths of our ontology, mm -hmm. if you'll allow me. We have, this is what, this is what I see exemplified in, Plato, right? You can't, if you really want to cultivate wisdom and courage and virtue, these are deeply perspectival participatory things. And therefore, your, your, your deepest patterns of intelligibility, your deepest patterns of coping and sense making are always bound up with your deepest patterns of caring and concern and identification. And so, I mean, if we want this to have existential depth, we have to touch upon the, you know, the the ontological um, depths as well. And so how to do this, and you can see that this is a vital issue in Plato. They talk about it in the dialogue. How to do this, you wanna be able to take people even to aporia where they're like, ah, it doesn't make sense anymore, but, but not tip them into, as you said, horror. Because the, the point isn't to, the, is to, isn't to immobilize people because they've now overexposed and they harden and now they're stuck. What you wanna do is you want to take that and get them to commit to it so that that becomes wonder and awe and it draws them forth in an aspirational commitment. Um, and so that is also part of the finesse of the, of the dialogos. And so I often describe this to Guy as, I want to take circling, but I want to bring philia sophia into it. I yeah. want to bring in, right? So we're doing all this stuff, all this really valuable and rich and juicy stuff with circling. But we, but if we get aware of all of these dimensions, can we then 
bring them in. Can we then bring in Philea Sophia? Because the deepest, and I mean, Guy is all on board about this because this is Heidegger's whole thing, right? You can't actually explore Dasein without exploring being. Those two are bound together uh, in, in just inseparable fashion. And so, um, I, 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 that's why I wanted to interrupt you. There was like four really important yes. things you had, you had, you had canvassed there, and I thought they yes. were important to slow down and open them up and unpack them a little bit. Yes, thank you for doing that. I th that was a beautiful unpacking, and I continue to invite you to slow me down and do just that. And and in many respects, the point I was making was one that was inviting you to jump in and slow it, slow it down <laughs> with me, because there's so much, and and yeah. it, it it needs to be it, there's there's time and care to be taken in presencing that, and also we're recording something for the benefit of listeners and viewers as well. So there's all these pieces, and um, and my sense as well is that so the sort of meta reflection which. Not that theory is precise. I mean, it's it's a reflection of a kind. It's but not so much an intellectual one as it is this bearing forth of where we are and our being in the mm. moment, which can look for a moment like a type of sort of meta um, taking oneself one, oneself out of the particular frame. There's there's a there's a deep. Um, hmm. Well. Th that is that is a process that should be gentle that is that is a process that should be gentle and and um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd like to i'd like to continue it so okay hmm. so where may be interesting to explore is where the perhaps where the jump back into theorizing takes place mm -hmm. within the space of theoria within the space of this presencing our being this affectively cooperatively realizing a shared space of care and vulnerability so that we can presence truly what we are as much as we can reveal of ourselves in accordance with what we can in an integrated fashion and respectful fashion be together in a space as appropriate to the setting and the setting is an is an important it's like not only are we doing this thing we're also building the table this is often what i'm talking to people about it's like not only are, not only are we presencing sort of ourselves in this dance at the same time there's a construction of the table at which this kind of conversation can take place of course you've yeah, been around much, those for so yeah. much of your life but with this with this online element right and with this um with that, with what seems to me that the genuine novelty of this, just because of, of how actually, of how existentially demanding I truly feel it is to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. move at this level, right? There is, you know, I, I, I come at this a lot as well from a perspective of therapy and what I conditions. Can't hear you, Tim. you can't hear me. Cut out. So let's, let's press ahead and trust the trust the process anyway it's it's really part and parcel of exactly what we're talking about um because you know it's this constant dynamic of feeling you know of of the desire to participate and then also accepting precisely where you are and not going too further than is just yeah. breaching the boundary <laughs> yeah. and this is yeah. a big part of my my day-to-day -day kind of process but where i believe i was at just to pick things up for our audience is presencing also this therapeutic aspect and the conditions mm. which enable in fact um, trauma to be m moved through and positively developed mm. or growth to occur from this state there's a sense in which we want to avoid that which we want to avoid presencing that which locks us and freezes us and stops us from being able yes. to be in a productive yeah. relationship with it and so yes there's a deep importance to this tenderly establishing this domain of shared care and where i was moving potentially and here's where i can pose a question is so we we theoria is in aiding us to presence the the being and the depths of our ontology creating a landscape of care in which that can be done 
Um, and then also, also now we might consider how we move back into the theory. And I wonder how you'd characterize right, right, that term. Right. So that's excellent. And, and that's that, I mean, and the thing, the thing of it is, again, we've got the germ of it because we've been doing it. Mm -hmm. we, we keep cycling here. Uh, and so it's not a matter of creating something de novo. It's a matter of trying to very, uh, through participant observation, trying to sort of delicately extricate into uh, sort of stable theory, theoretical terms and formulation. What is, what is, what is that's going on here? And so, um, there, there seems to be some aspects here. Uh, the turn back to theory is um, the kind, uh, the kind of thing I see going on again in the Platonic dialogue, in which you are not. There's never, there's, there's never monologic argumentation. There's argumentation, but it's always bound up with questioning because you're always seeking to involve the other. And there's as much um, a again. A, 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 a receptivity for, a seeking of insight as there is um, the attempt to, you know, uh, uh, come to some sort of argumentative conclusion. Um, so, well, well, there should be theor theory going on and theorizing. Uh, I don't, it, it, I, 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 I sound like I'm splitting hairs, but I'm trying to be very, very careful here. Well, there should be theorizing going on. I don't think there should be theory building going on. Uh, which is a, which is a different thing, mm -hmm. right? So one of the, I mean, again, again, I, I'm asking for everybody's patience. I'm trying to. This is very much a work in progress. But you know what? Theorize. The, we keep theorizing. We we step back and we do the theory. We we represence ourselves. We restructure the salience landscape. We reinvestigate. We resensitize. We're doing all that stuff, right? And then, but then we also do this. We we bring we. Uh, and this is where uh, guys' invo invocation of this phrase I think is so pregnant. We come to terms. We come to terms mm. about what's happening there. We we try to. It's almost like poesis. We try to put into terms, and then and then and then we and then we we question each other. We challenge each other. We we link things together. But the inference is always open to being impregnated and redirected by the insight, and the insight is always open to being challenged and right mm. restructured again. Uh, by the inference, we're trying to get. It's very much like when I with the stuff where I talk about, you know, and how in rationality we're trying to balance insight and inference and internalization off against each other. That's why I think it, you can't really come into these practices in any depth um, if you are if you haven't already started down a sapiential pathway where you've got some ecology, you've got some individual practices for insight and inference and internalization, and you've got some a basic ecology for. For, for networking them together, because I, th I think that's what you're trying to do in theorizing. So the theorizing is, yeah, yeah I'm bringing up elements of theory in that there, there's inferential moves being made, there's insight, and, and those are, are talking to each other. But I don't get into monologue, right? The internalization is always present. You're always there. You're always impregnating. And I'm using all these metaphors because those are the metaphors Socrates is, uses, mm -hmm. right? And we still think about the, how the word concept originally goes back to conceive right and being the midwife so there's that but we're not trying to to, to 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 we're trying to stay with plato and not get into aristotle not because aristotle doesn't have value but in aristotle i don't think it's due to aristotle i think it's due to an accident of history but in aristotle all we have is the monologic treatise and we want to stay in the platonic dialogue elsewhere when we're doing the science then we do the aristotelian thing then we do the theory building we should theorize there should be inference and insight and internalization, but we shouldn't do theory building. We should generate lots of things that we can then look back on and say, right? Oh, from from within that participant observation, there's a, all of these things. I could take them out and do some theory building, or I can bring some theory over here and cognitive science to bear on this. And that's why I think there's kind of a meta dialogue between what's going on in dialogos and, and the scientific study of distributed cognition and collective intelligence. So. I don't know if that's adequate, but I think it's a good beginning. You know, that the turn back to theory is is and that's a, that's that's appropriate and fine to say, but keep it distinct from the 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 desire to to drop into monologic theory building. That that's one of the things I would recommend. Yes, I hear that. I hear that. Okay, so so here's something that may open this out in a, in an interesting way. Um, or maybe bring it to a more fine point. 
So something that has been a key interest of mine for some years has been the the you know a, a recurse you know a, a seeking sort of a recursive elegance to how I express modes of orientation in particular states of consciousness um, and the reason I'm presencing this is because also as well I, I believe what I'm looking to do when I'm using some terms to refer to these modes of orientation in consciousness which may look very much like particular meditative or contemplative turns mm -hmm. within your own experience right the mindfulness vipassana and the the, the contemplation the, the sort of grasping out again the, the sort of paying attention to something beyond just the um well there's like a, there's like the internal um mm -hmm. quietening um the paying attention to what sort of flowing through and then there's also it's moving again towards me it's slightly more on the side of well it's certainly more in touch with the world in a little way attempting to mm -hmm. feel into a deeper connection with it um and and i'm i mean to speak from a perspective that's process philosophical so i'm not looking to, sp sure. to speak from a perspective where we are sort of identifying the f fixed substances bashing into each other and certainly not because ultimately what what i would like to move towards as well is invoking a discussion of sacredness and the sacred in here mm -hmm. too because there's a sense in which mm -hmm. sacredness as you articulated in the series must be seen through a lens of well of course it's forever incomplete yet at the same time yes. enabling of experiences of, of deep connection and unity. So it's the relevance realization that never ends. It's continued transformation. And this is very much accordant with how it, it sits very well with me. It, it's in my own theorizing, it's a deep constitutive part of that. Yet I also feel I'm, I'm looking for and have been looking for some um, reliable ways to refer to what is experienced in cycles of transformation, which are something like waypoints, which could be mistaken for a certain kind of fixation, but they're not a fixation yes. on the substance side of things. It's not a finality. It's not like this is all there is and the process is complete. When we spoke last time, we spoke a little bit about teleology. And I realized that the way I was using teleology was in a continual self-making sense, which is not semantically how, mm -hmm. you, how, we, how you were using that word. And I may not mm -hmm. be entitled mm -hmm. to use the word teleology precisely because I'm endorsing a continued self-making, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm endorsing mm -hmm. a continued mm -hmm. self-making in respect of what enables, like what, what are the core orientation modes? What are the, the fundamental features that the almost the minimal viable necessities for a successful transformation that enables further transformation it seems to me like mm -hmm, some mm -hmm, paths mm -hmm. do end fundamentally um mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, what we are mm -hmm. is a process of opening and closing as appropriate to continue transformation and i refer to that in my own to my own self as and and people as loving transformation mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this seems appropriate to me and it, it's it, relevance realization may in fact just be that or it might be a key like a very a deep piece of it and then in a slightly more and, and i guess i have this loving transformation of something like a um, self-making telos in perpetuity um mm -hmm. but it also mm -hmm. these notions of agape mm -hmm. in there and anagoge so it's a loving because it's because yeah. yes. the constitutive goal element of relevance realization which which it needs it's coming it's like it's like a givenness that it, it take like it takes finds itself interesting for itself i say it's yes. loving for itself it's not just uh, the interest yes. isn't yes. enough isn't enough for me it's not enough i think it needs right. the love okay and in this deep interconnected yeah. way and what we're doing when we're caring for each other it's the agape as as you as you express it's this love 
And so, yes, um, that's quite a lot of thoughts. I know I've jumped a fair way ahead here, but it may be one. It was wonderful, though. Yeah. It was re I really, I found that wonderful. Yeah. I found that wonderful. Yeah. Um, oh, there's so much there. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, so, so, yeah. The way you wove that together, it's, I didn't want to interrupt because it was flowing so smoothly. Um, let me try and see if I can riff on some mm -hmm. of the, uh, the, the, the points that sort of spring to mind uh, as I review, uh, the course of that. Um, so let's, let's, let's start with the, the love and it, this brings us back to that notion I had and you invoked uh, Anagage as well as Agape. So I think it's appropriate Th this notion of mutually reciprocal opening, mutually accelerating disclosure. Right. Um, and the idea that. You know, if I understand vulnerability as a sensitivity, a sensitivity to allowing not just my mind, but my identity to be restructured, not just in a cognitive insight, but in an existential insight, mm. that will call forth, that will adduce, right? And maybe there's a vulnerability to the world that will call forth or adduce from the world. It will disclose itself in ways it couldn't disclose itself to me before. There was a way in which I was imposing on the world and now in a kind of will to power, a romantic sense, and now if I, if I do that restructuring of my identity, that, that allows the world to disclose itself in a way. This is Wright's notion of a sensibility transcendence. And that, that, and that we experience, this is Aaron's work, we, we experience mutually accelerating disclosure as love. That's how you fall in love with somebody or something or some place. Mm. That, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's that deep, that, that's the knowing of yourself and the knowing of whatever it is you're, Right, you're coupled to are so interbound together that your the 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 inherent self-loving, which isn't the same thing as selfishness, of relevance realization is bound up with the relevance realization that is occurring, you know, directed towards the world. I think all of that, the way you put that together, um, yes, I understand also uh, the thinness of the word interest. I tried to use that word, and I'm doing work with John Logan on this. I was trying to go back to the original meaning of the word, inter-essay, to be within something, to be within something, and trying to revalorize, uh, that we, like many of our terms, we've trivialized that we've thinned it out to be just as be a simple referential label and not, not something that sort of more poetically discloses the depths of something. But to be within, inter-essay, that, right, like, so I was... I was trying to play on the idea that relevance realization is constituted by its it, it, it exists within mm. this kind of relationship to itself. If it if it if it's not self monitoring and self caring and self coping and self making and self organizing, if it's not profoundly autopoetic in that way, it's not going to be functioning as relevance realization. Uh, so I, I understand what you're trying to convey with love. Uh, what I'm saying is I it was my intent with the word interest do that etymological exploration to try to get back to uh, that deeper meaning um, and, and therefore give people a term. So uh, let me be careful here. Give people a term other than love for trying to talk about something that grounds what we normally call love. But now you've, you've taken it another way. You've said, no, I want to take the word love and I want to deepen it down to reach this transformative depth. I think those two things are actually conversion. I think those two points are, are actually uh, deeply convergent. And then that brings me into uh, the other thing that, and here's, in, in theorizing, we want to talk about it, we want to do conceptual analysis on it, but in theoria, we're trying to invoke it. We're, as you're saying, we're trying to presence it and we're trying to give it a, like we're trying to give it a functional role, right? A, a place mm. in a deep sense of the word within the, the dialogue. And man, is the sacred ever, well, at least sacredness, is that ever present in the Platonic dialogues as well? It constantly, it, it, it's invoked, like, a, you know, Socrates even ends the Phaedrus by, with a prayer uh, mm. for, to the god Pan, mm. and, and what other, other gods were present throughout the dialogue, right? So I think uh, talking about, while well, trying to also simultaneously invoke, and that's what you always have to do in participative observation, right? Try, about the, the sacredness, I think, is, is also relevant, because once we start getting into this, this idea of love and inter-essay, maybe if I use the Latin, that'll be better. We try to get into the, so let's, let's, say, let's, let's say the love aspect is the anagogic 
mutually accelerating disclosure. And then the inter-essay is the sinking to the depths, right? The sinking to the ontological depths. So we've got the love and we've got the, in, right, the inter-essay they're going on. I think that is going to take us because it's taking us into, it's taking us into the womb from which, mm. you know, meaning as connection um, is born. It's taking us into sacredness. It's taking us into the experience that when we, when we get this kind of deep coupling, the, the Hebrew word da'ath comes to mind here, when we get this kind of deep coupling with the love and the inter-essay, right, we're, we're getting into realizing, again, playing, as you noted, I use that word to mean both a subjective and an objective and thereby convey the transjective. We're, we're realizing in a completely interdependent, interdependent fashion the open-endedness of our relevance realization machinery and the inexhaustibleness of the, of, of the combinatorial explosive nature of reality. And that when those, if we have just the combinatorial explosive nature, that's horror, that's terror. If we have just the open-endedness and it's not disclosing anything, that's, that's, a, that's a kind of hunger, right? That's a kind of hunger. Right, but when when the two are coupled together such that they are mutually revealing, mutually disclosing, the open endedness of the relevance realization and, and the inexhaustibleness, so that I'm experiencing the depths of reality and the depths of my relevance realization as a continually flowing fount of continually emerging emerging intelligibility. That I think um, is. Um, I, I think I could make a very good case that in many mystical traditions and philosophical traditions, that's the understanding of sacredness mm. as an experience. I use the word sacredness to talk about the experience, and then I use the word the sacred or sacred, uh, typically the sacred, to try to refer to whatever proposal we have as to what the metaphysical or ontological basis of that experience is. But I think this ex the experience of sacredness is very much and that's why it's always filled with awe and reverence and even a tinge of horror, because it's getting us, it's opening us up to that sort of fundamental, the no thingness of at the at the at the I, I don't I, I want to at the base of relevance realization and the no thingness uh, at the base of of, of the way the uh, reality discloses itself to us, and so I think that's a new way of trying to recapture. So I'm trying to be very careful here. What's, uh, it's, I'm trying to bring some new language to something that I think nevertheless has an ancient heritage and legacy. I think a lot of the mystical traditions and the wisdom traditions speak about sacredness this way because it's, it's a kind of, it's a sense of sacredness that is deeply connected to the cultivation of self-transcendence and wisdom. And I offer this as an alternative to uh, another uh, prevalent and uh, longstanding notion of sacredness as perfection where perfection is understood as coming to rest, coming to completion. And that was what I always, I've always objected to the word telos, because perfection and completion are bound, well, etymologically, to the word telos. And so that, that, that sense of, of a teleology um, um, is, it, it, that's the aspect of the, the, that I was resisting and challenging. Because I think the notion of that what I'm experiencing, and, and, and here's, I'm not only criticizing sort of standard classical theism, there's a way in which I'm criticizing Plato here. Because there's definitely places where he gets into talking about this in terms of perfection. And I think there's, there's a mistake here. It's unclear what he means by that, but it's fair that people have come away from that and saying, oh, the sacred is something that is perfect that generates the experience of perfection. Descartes certainly does this in the meditation, right? And that's what this is all about. And I think, I think that's just a profound uh, mistake. I think that's just a profound mistake. So I think that one of the things that Dia Logos reveals, and here, think about the Logos now as, as the anagoge, as the love, and also the interesse, the deepening, right? And it's taking on a life of its own and then birthing us and giving us life from itself, right? I think the sacredness in Dialogos needs to be the sacredness, not of perfection, but the sacredness of the inexhaustible. Mm. Yeah, I hear that, John. That's beautiful. I agree. I agree. Um, you know, I, I, 
Hmm. So, so what is, so there's, so we are not, we are not, we are not perfecting the sacred, but we are continually optimizing our capacity to make sacred. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's where the analogy to evolution, biological evolution is so helpful to me. If you, I mean, and people do fall prey to the temptation to think that evolution is a ladder, that there's a teleology in it. I'm talking about biological evolution. We talk about cultural evolution aside. I understand that that's different. I just want to use the standard model of biological evolution to explain my analogy, right? Right. There, there isn't a ladder. Evolution isn't, evolution isn't seeking the perfect, final, complete design. What it's always doing is this has worked for a moment or two in geological time, which means it's a reliable basis for me to make something new now from that, which will then, if it works, will be a reliable basis for me to make something new, which if it lands, to use Peter Lindbergh's favorite phrase, and the, right, and the, the phrase I hear in circling, if it lands, then it gives me a, a stable platform from which I can make something new again, yes. and so on and so forth. I'm not, I'm not trying to bring it to completion. And here's where, here's where I, I want to say another point. Um, because this, this relates again to dialogue and the difference between dialogue and story, even though we put dialogue in story. Mm. Um, but the, so I think narrative is psychologically indispensable for us developmentally. I think if we don't cultivate narrative, we can't, narrative teaches me to grasp non-logical identity. It teaches me what it means to say, I'm identical to that four-year-old and I'll be identical to the 75 year old man who's retired. So narrative gives me deep practice in a temporally extended self that has non-logical identity. And that is so important for my rationality and my cognition and my metacognition. I think narrative is indispensable. But I don't think narrative is final or complete. A lot of the traditions, and so there's some psychological work, say that people can move to sort of a post-narrative state. Um, in which they operate. I think you can see various trends of Buddhism, Taoism, and Stoicism advocating moving to a trans-narrative state. Now, why do I say that? Because the thing about narrative, right, is, right, if you try to impose a narrative on biological evolution, what people do, then they get it fundamentally wrong because narrative is teleologically oriented. It moves towards closure. It moves towards finality. It moves towards perfection. And they live happily ever after. Narrative, right, ultimately, while psychologically indispensable to giving us all of the machinery we need to exact for wisdom, ultimately, I think, has to be left behind if we're going to operate within dialogue the way it does. That's why, although you, there's clearly sort of some narrative elements to the Platonic dialogue, many of them don't end with narrative closure. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not, they're not resolved, completed stories. And the relationship between the dialogues is not one of narrative. It's one of sort of an ecology in which they're talking to each other and check. It's a dialogic relationship. There's, there's a meta dialogue between each of the individual dialogues. And I think that we, we have to be paying more, more and more attention uh, to that. And I think there's been a deep connection for deep historical reasons uh, between the ontology of perfection and, and the symbolization of narrative. We've tended to think of narrative, sacredness, and perfection as, 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 as inextricably bound together. Again, I want to be really careful about this. I'm not denying, right? I'm not denying the importance of narrative. I'm not denying the fact that often what people are trying to express with perfection is they feel as something is per perpetually transcendent to them. I'm just saying there are post-narrative, post-perfection ways, I think, of referring to what people are ascending towards in a way that doesn't misrepresent the kind of, as I said it before, the kind of formulation we need, the kind of, yep, the kind of, as you said, the, the, the way we're presencing in order for dialogos to work. Mm, mm. Mm, yes. Yes. And and we and then we find ourselves here and now mm -hmm. in a collaborative always collaborative participatory making realization mm -hmm. of the course that we can be on together in coherence that enables us to continue to be on course together is still this notion of course that Darth you speak about and yeah and so very let's, much, very much. let's let's bring this in here because what because 
because yes tra- that's why that's why we use the word discourse mm. that's, that's why we use the word discourse we're 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 picking up on the fact that there is a con- there is a coursing there is a coursing going on and and of course da'ath was also bound up with the sense that there's a course to history mm. right and of course we use course of course <laughs> we use course as a way of pointing to a a, a pedagogical path all of these things yes very much mm. Okay, now I now I I'm going to see if I can bring in a frame here that that may well be concordant. It may be meaningfully different, but it is. If I weren't to bring it forth, then I'd be leaving something important to the side, because I'd I'd like please, to please do, I'd like to do. take what we've presenced here and then see if if again we can cap. Because I'm still I'm interested in let's say for the sake of this conversation seems part of what seems to be driving me. I'm interested in 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 saving, keeping what is necessary and helpful in the notion of telos, while mm-hmm. while already already in some sense absolutely changing it by by saying okay we are only going to take forward for the purpose of this conversation a self making a continually self making telos and it's not a finality of thingness that we're looking for. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Evan Thompson. Th- Evan Thompson talks about this and living things as an imminent tele- teleology. Beautiful. Right. And and he's hearkening back to Kant there, um, and so uh, and that living things because they're self oriented, it's they have an imminent teleology in that the teleology is is completely recursive. Mm. The, te- the 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 purpose is to maintain the ability to like it, it's 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 you say it, it's it's. It's the purpose of maintaining the self-making. Mm, yes, yes, beautiful. So we are absolutely on the same page with that. What very much? I have no objection to that sense of teleology. I have no objection whatsoever. I think it's integral if we're going to understand autopoiesis and aspiration. I, I, I think it's integral. Beautiful. Uh, okay. That. Okay. Excellent. Um, what we encounter in experience, and what we are also contending with in our lives, is the supreme depths of our lineage and the vast unknown of the mm. future and mm. also the mm. inconsistency mm. of duration as we experience it different experiences we can f- you will commonly hear people refer to you know like it felt like three years in that in that few short weeks or whatever yeah. or it felt like hours and it was just yeah. mere seconds or minutes and we can talk about this thing perhaps from the perspective of the brain and the release of chemicals and stuff like that that's that's fine but but there's actually but i i am i am very influenced by bergson as i know you are as well i heard you in a conversation i heard you really Im- appreciating that notion of jure and for me yeah with jp yeah yeah with yeah with jp yeah and given my um interest and exploration with psychedelics as well as other kinds of practices i am i am well aware of the the atemporality and the vast expansiveness that can seemingly be experienced right and become very very difficult to integrate into a coherent theory but perhaps yeah. in the right yeah. dialogue in fact we can begin to work with these things because okay so here here sure. here, here we are this self making to enable further self making must realize itself according to patterns it must it, like it, it must be it's it's humble before and within the yeah. patterns that Keep already going. enable Keep it going. and yes, must yes. and it deeply participates in the realization of patterns that will continue to afford its flourishing if we were to step back and look at that we're not seeing chaos we are with the right tools in mind, seeing a certain pattern and the certain kind of pattern that can be beautifully artistically represented. People might use a mandala. They might use just a beautiful image of, you know, uh, a human being. I'm, I'm, I'm struck, I'm struck by feminine beauty and I'm struck by how there's a sense of a a Mm -hmm. timeless, alluring, drawing forth beauty in it and a magnificence. And, and there's a sense in which there's a sense in which, there's a sense in which if I attend to myself, I am, I can become a, a more caring, a better person in whatever way we want to wrap that up over the, over a period of time. I, I want to be, I, I want to be,
be able to be more and more appropriately realize my potential and i f and i feel very strongly that in so doing i can more effectively contribute and be in caring in a caring relationship with the world and i want to look at that aesthetic and go this yeah, here to me is yeah. meaningful and there was a course here that was there was a there is a way that was walked which had a pattern to it which while itself is not in any deep sense the only one it's not fixed that's not what there is there is there is there is was a cycle of development there you know i loved and i let mm. go appropriately and i opened myself again and i faced courageously no, no, the depths no. of experience yeah, yeah. Yeah. and so okay, so the final thing to add into this like and then i'm would absolutely love to hear your responses is this is this no, take your time take your time the, please. the modes of orientation which enable that continued pattern making the humble for the past the you know learning as much as possible and then opening up and creating that future because we must create our future we must create it in an important sense by not making many of the mistakes we've made heretofore i follow the line of thinking yeah. associated yeah. with jordan hall an awful lot with respect to civilization design and what have you but it's so okay so that's uh, how about i stop there and then there there's another piece to introduce but let's see if um how that sort of sits yeah, no, no, that there's, so there's lots of points of resonance that are coming up for me. Um, so there's, there's a, you were talking about sort of um, the deep connection uh, between temporality and um, how ontology can um, put a call upon us. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, and you see this, you see this in higher states of consciousness when people experience the really real, they experience what I call ontonormativity. They feel, because because meaning is about being connected. They want to be deeply connected. So they want an increasingly more intimate conformity with this really real. Mm. And so they will transform their lives and their identity. So it deeply empowers the aspiration to transformation mm. that you were talking about. Um, I, so, and that again, I think that's very much a platonic model. And then you were invoking something that of course, Plato sees as bound up with that. Um, Wow, this is weird bringing Plato and Bergson together. You would, <laughs> that's a, it just struck me as a very interesting and odd thing to juxtapose them that way. But Plato, of course, talks a great deal about beauty um, and, and that it, it has a capacity uh, to, in, in, to inspire us to aspirations. Uh, Skari talks about this in her book about how beauty prepares us for truth and justice because of the way it transforms our sensibility and transforms our motivation so that we become more and more capable of seeing the truth and we become more and more capable of acting justly and so while there, while beauty isn't truth it is a deep affordance of a aspirational path to becoming more truthful and to becoming more just and i think all of that um i mean and, and i think uh, iris murdoch uh, saw that that was clearly what was um, in the center of a lot of the platonic and the neoplatonic tradition so i think all of that is very inter i think it resonates with everything you just said um and then let's bring it back to the thing that started it which was the the the, the different experiences of, of temporality because we're, we're talking again about we're talking about this anagogic process we're talking about the process that the way beauty couples me in such a way that my identity is restructured the my my sensibility, my salience landscape is restructured so the way the world can disclose itself because beauty and love are bound intricately up together. You get that mutually accelerating disclosure and beauty is often a call to that. Mm -hmm. It's often, right, if it's, right, it, 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 it has that kind of call upon us. It draws us forth. But then there, there is this, and then, you know, and of course this is a Heideggerian notion too, I suppose, but there, there's, the sense in which we're moving, and, and this is something that I talked about with JP, JP or more so, I've had a bunch of really excellent conversations with him. I'm gonna have one very shortly with him and with Mary Cohen. Um, so I'm looking forward to that a lot. But there's a sense in which, I, it, it, think about Whitehead, because in Whitehead, White, Whitehead of course is deeply uh, uh, platonic, he, 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 he clearly indicates that but he's also very deeply consonant with a lot of Bergson. So maybe he's somebody we could use to, to talk about this bridge between them. But what I see, I, what I see in Whitehead is I see this bipolar um, ontology. Let, let me try and articulate this a little. You definitely, you, you know, he says that, you know, the many are gathered into the one that becomes something new. So everything, everything is interpenetrating everything else. And, and then it causes new emergence. So you've got this, 
if you'll allow me these metaphors, you have this bottom-up emergence. But he talks about the fact, and you you put your finger on this, the way, right, the way things emerge. They emerge in a way that, again, we, we get the sense that possibility, and you know that I take possibility to be a real category and not just a conjectural category, that possibility, and this is, this is Whitehead's notion, that the platonic forms were in some sense a way in which possibility is structured. And if you'll allow me a neoplatonic notion, that, that structuring of possibility emanates into the patterns that are, are afforded to emerge within the emergence. And then those patterns, of course, access the structured possibility. There's a way in which the bottom-up emergence and the top-down emanation are completely interpenetrating with each other. This is why I've been so deeply attracted to the work of John Scottus Erigena uh, from within the Christian tradition. He's, he's this titanic figure, uh, and, and it, like in, from the ninth century, and that he, but he's also regarded as a heretic. Uh, uh, but it's interesting because he's seen as the great synthesizer of Eastern and Western Christi Christendom, Christianity and Neoplatonism. He was, he was elevated to very high status um, in the court, and then he was asked to produce a document, and he did, uh, the Paraphusia on the Division of Nature. And then when, when this came out, controversy swirled mm -hmm. around him. His, he tried to articulate this idea of creation, right, as something that should be understood as being the complete interpenetration of e emanation from eternity and emergence within time. And that instead of thinking them as opposite, we have to think of them. So his metaphysics, he doesn't just use a dialectic because he writes the, his the Parafusion as, as a dialogue, but it, Dialectic is the ontological structure he feel he sees like in reality itself that it's inherently dialectic precisely because of the complete top to bottom interpenetration of emanation and um, emergence within creation mm. um, and, and, and and so and and then and then to and then to top it all off because of the particular notion of God which I think is where the her heresy comes in um, he sees all of that as one with God's inherent self-creativity. Mm -hmm. That when God is creating, that, that is always just an act of self-creation. So it's th that this dialectic of, that the dialectic of, of creation is, is, is inseparable from God's um, ongoing self-creativity. Um, and so he see, again, again, it's a different notion of the sacred as this ongoing inexhaustible production of intelligibility as opposed to the at rest uh, uh, perfection. Uh, so that's why I imagine he was regarded as heretical. He's now sort of come back around um, and people are starting to uh, consider him much more carefully even within theological circles, precisely because this, this ontology that he talks about seems to be so apt uh, for talking about these, these two things that we're trying to bring together within our worldview, and I would add, apt for providing a deep grounding, a deep ontological grounding for discursive dialectic, like what you and I are doing right here, right now. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Okay. So two things come to mind. Both take a long time to say. Let me see if I can reduce both quickly so that hopefully we don't lose either. The first is that I would continue to like to hone in on what I mean by modes of orientation. Yes, and, I would too. And the second is just how much I'm interested in the continued discussion and um, careful experimentation with with the embedding and invitation of more people to participate in community mm. regarding what we're speaking about in such a fashion that well that 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 uh well does it justice it cares for it but i'm also interested in the i do feel a sense of urgency and i appreciate the importance mm. of being mm. slow and smooth i i deeply do and um i also feel a sense of urgency and i and i feel that in our culture, we are lacking the pillar where a polis can be together and mutually inform each other and disclose yeah, themselves yeah. in this fashion so that we can become more in touch with 
the state of our collective moment and our connection to ecology and how we can actually begin yes, to yeah, take powerful yeah. decisions. Powerful decisions must, to me, they should be taken from, from an already exhibited capacity to presence oneself in relationship with this very process of the generation and development of wisdom. If they're not coming mm -hmm. from that, then it, it's 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 deeply it's it's actually horrifying. It's horrifying. Yes. And yes. Um, which is why we're getting into what we're in in some ways. Yes. Keep going. Okay. So that's that. And but maybe we could go the the modes of orientation route first, which is please. I, first of all, I like the terms. I think it's excellent. Um, and uh, I'd like so. Uh, I'll get, I'll, 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 I want to turn back things to you very momentarily. Yes. I've noticed that at crucial points, um, you invoke this as something that was playing a pivotal, meaning capacity to turn things, um, you, playing a pivotal role um, in uh, one note, uh, one a moment of theoria, by the way. It's important to step back and in a Heideggerian fashion, like I just did and like you've done, to step back and the degree to which you can, and sometimes we make mistakes about this, and I, I've made some myself, but the degree to which we can, and so more education is needed, but the degree to which we can, pay attention to the etymology. Try to give life back to the words mm. so that they can resonate in a way that is beyond our normal, everyday manipulation and control of them. Give them back some of their being so they're not just words that we have. Mm. So, like I said, so we've got... And we're trying to do this right now, I think, with modes of orientation. And I, and I was trying to do it when I, I was invoking this term pivotal, that you invoke modes of orientation because it's a pivot. It allows us to move and shift things that are otherwise heavy or hard to move because we've, we've, we've found a balance and a point at which such redirection becomes possible for us. So, you know, the ways in which mode of orientation um, is pivotal, I think, is what, what I was picking up on and what I want to try and explore with you. I just wanted to make that note again, that Theoria note, about the value of re-impregnating our words as much as possible by paying attention to their metaphoricity and to their etymology. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And it's something that you evidence to an incredible degree in your lectures. And I think it's one of the one of the many chief reasons why they afford people to open up their conceptions so much. And... Um, yeah, it's great. So, so okay. Um, so modes of orientation then, fundamentally, a, well, no, fundamentally, a key piece in the role that these modes of orientation are playing is in our relationship to death and dissolution. And mm -hmm. broadly speaking, mm -hmm. the chaos that can enter our experience, the horror as well, right? The, the dislodging. Yeah. Yeah, very much. How is it, like, how can we find ourselves again how can we find connection again from a place of disconnection in some respects that's yeah. one that's one thing that's important and the yeah. other is also how we can front up to change how we can from a place of sort of coherence that's become stagnated and stultified decide bravely to move over the boundary right to confront sure. and attend and it seems to me the the yeah. capacity to attend in different modes is is sort of um it's I, I, it's it's hard for me to imagine the pictures we're sp that, that we're speaking about without those fundamental building blocks of just how auto poetic processes can be in relationship which is other than their immediate domain of autopoesis at all how can we how can we transgress and transframe our boundaries without, in some sense, yeah, the, yeah. the courage to be with the not knowing and ultimately to, to surrender in some sense and also to confront the two terms that were pivotal for me in making sense of some deep psychedelic experience I had were confrontation and surrender. I'm not attached to either. There is a negative and positive mode of each, no, no. but they're just what the no, terms are. Maybe... I would be interested to hear how you would take the uh, this kind of discussion, and I'm not attached to having to do it through the lens I'm bringing. Sure. So there's a lot. There's a lot there. 
I like uh, so let's 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 gather together logos yeah. gather together so that things belong together uh that that you know there, there's this there's this there's this encouragement and in caring that is bound up with the mode of orientation as you said um because what we're facing is we're facing the real possibility of dissolution a, a, a kind of death and so it's interesting. There's a term, of course, in dynamical systems that tries to point to this, which is criticality. A system is critical um, when it is undergoing enough dissolution uh, that it can restructure and reframe itself. But if it if it, if it takes too much, then it, it it will actually fall into dis dissolution. So that's why it's called critical. Uh, it, it's it's playing on both senses of the word uh, uh, critical. I think in a very nice fashion. So, I think. One of the things that's critical, one of the things that can get us into criticality um, and that we don't, our culture is not good at, and this is why I've spent some time on it, I keep coming back to it, is serious play. Um, and serious play, I think, is... I think I think it's 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 something that has been exacted. You see it in, in mammals, not just in us, right? Serious play is, I think, indispensable uh, for qualitative development, the kind of development you're talking about here, the, the development that the kind there's development that is uh, quantitative, where you just acquire more and more knowledge and more information, and then there's qualitative development, uh, which I think you can best understand as development that must pass through criticality to get to the developmental stage. You can't just keep sort of more of the same and acquire more. You actually have to. You need new functionality, and so you have to put the current functionality at risk. It has to go into a period of criticality. And what we see is, and, 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 and you know, and, and I think this just is convergent with the brilliant work of L.A. Paul and the brilliant work of Agnes Callard about we can't sort of, and, and, and Fodor's work about you can't infer a stronger logic from a weaker logic. You can't infer yourself through these transformations. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to aspire through them. Um, and I've tried to argue uh, that this is, that, that the notion of serious play was part of what was at work in, in Nos in the Gnostics, or at least that in, within Gnosis, uh, because Gnosis is again, the Greek word for that deep kind of participatory uh, knowing. And, and, and of course the Gnostics, they sought to place themselves into exactly the kind of existential risk that you're talking about here. De Connick talks about that, how transgressive uh, 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 they are. So the point about the, the serious play is, it's, it's how I think human beings it's it, it it it's how we put ourselves into a a a what's called meta stability a state of criticality so that qualitative development is actually um, possible for us while also setting up a whole bunch of constraints and systems so that we can back out or reverse out uh, if needed uh, we don't over and completely commit um, so that uh, like we there. We create a situation within serious play in which we can taste and touch the criticality, but error is not completely disastrous for us. There's, there's more error tolerance. Um, so the child is playing with the plastic sword, um, right? Um, and, you know, and, and perhaps, you know, and, and I'm not saying we should have it in military, militaristic culture. I'm just using it for ease of, expor of explanation. You know, and the point about the plastic, I, I do Tai Chi with a wooden sword. There we go. I do shoot Tai Chi with a wooden sword. It's serious play because, you know, I'm putting myself into, you know, clumsiness, following. I can hurt myself for sure. But because it's a wooden sword and there's, it's done within a particular context, uh, as opposed to combat with a military sword, error isn't quite as disastrous. There's much more error tolerance so that I can, and I want to use this word very, very uh, deliberately, I can play with the possibilities to try and get that the ah, that sense of okay how do i how do i course my way through this how do i course my way through this and i think why it's a problem for us in our cultures we don't have we we don't we don't think about or talk about or do a lot to valorize or validate serious play play is either trivialized into fun for us or we think if it's important and serious, it must be work. Mm. And then we, there's a step and an algorithm and a recipe for getting there, which of course is not how development works. 
And the place where cultures generally do serious play for adults, and also perhaps for children, but primarily for adults, is ritual. That's what ritual is. It's the place where we do serious play. I mean, if you go into church and, it's, and, and you open yourself up, mode of orientation, to the serious play that's going on there, if, if, if that's viable for you, I'm not saying it's viable, I don't think it would be viable for me, but if it's viable for you, right, and you get involved with the serious play of the Eucharist, or let's say it's Easter, the portrayal of the crucifixion and the res, like, woo, like you're playing with your identity and you're playing with some of your deepest affective machinery and you're really allowing you, like you're, you're involved with a kind of profound serious play that nevertheless, there's a community around you, there's a tradition around you, you've been taken into a space outside of the ongoing profane space of the world, so you're safe from the world for a while. So there's a lot more error tolerance, there's a lot more support, and there's a ritual that other people have tried, so you're not just starting it in, in an autodidactic fashion from scratch. Um, and so I think there are, there are deep connections between the meaning crisis and our inability to take up the appropriate modes of modes of orientation, precisely because our culture is really, really poor at uh, dealing with serious play. Like, and, and notice how how poorly, and I mean that even economically, we reward people who who live lives in which serious play, like musicians and artists and other th people who have decided that serious play is something that needs to be exemplified and enacted, we tend to say, but that's not as important as work. You know, this Protestant work, the work, work hard, make, you know, all that's not that we shouldn't work. I'm not saying that, uh, but we, I mean, again, another symptom of the meaning crisis, and this has become a pervasive. We have a culture and work workaholism, right? Workaholism. What is it? Workaholism is, I think it's- the I'll word. accept it. Uh, workaholics. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's basically people, people do not know how to be other than work. So they do not know how to become really because they can't engage in serious play. And uh, Han talks about this in the agony of ecstasy. They, they get into a, a, you know, a, a, a mode of self-exploitation where they're constantly driven to achieve, to achieve, to achieve, and they can't engage in actual development in serious play. So when they're not working, all they can do is to drop into a kind of tuper, almost a lethargy of luxury. They, like, so the idea that, um, that something really important goes on, all you're doing is basically recovering so that you can go back uh, to work. Mm. And so I think that's also a, a very important social problem um, that um, I, is feeding back into the meaning crisis because of the way it is foreclosing for us access to the modes of orientation that are most appropriate for deep development. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's remarkable to me because you tied the link there between modes of orientation and the development of a space within culture where people can precisely come together and seriously play in the fashion we're doing you just it, described. We're doing it. We're doing it right now, and this is yes. what I mean about uh, and uh, and this is why I often so so I I, I typically don't respond to comments uh, in the videos because first of all, there's too many, and I couldn't, I can't, and secondly, people are people are often just extemporaneous, you know, expressing, and that's fine. I don't that's fine do that and they often they want to talk to other people all of that and there's all those reasons sometimes if somebody catches me on a factual error then i'll i'll, I'll admit it and i'll respond that way or if there's a, a if there's somebody else that i'm on like you if you commented i'd respond because we have an ongoing dialogue and i know that i have access to you in a deep dialogue not the superficial format of commenting on youtube which i think can be very irresponsible in in so many ways so but right I, I rep I've replied a couple times when people have commented in my dialogues with Jordan Hall and they say like, this isn't going anywhere. And, I, and I'm trying to, it's like, no, no, stop thinking of this as work, right? What Jordan is doing is he is exemplifying a very profound kind of serious play. He's showing us how through participatory knowing what serious what serious play and dialogue is like because he is trying to afford development much more than he's trying to come to a conclusive proposition 
And that's what needs to be paid very careful attention to. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, I absolutely agree. And that's certainly a, a deep reason why I respect Jordan so much for what he's doing. And um, I feel a, I feel a, a deep resonance actually on that point. Um, you know, generally speaking, moving around in the world, I'm engaging with people much the same as this. I think usually with more, with a bit more lightness. Not that I haven't felt light in this, but there's also the sense in which that this is recorded and I'm sort of sitting still. I actually like to move around quite <laughs> yeah. a lot, you know. I'm, yeah, um, me, me too, yeah. me too. Um, and, but, but, but fundamentally, the way in to meaningful relationships with people is almost always, and maybe it is always, I just want to have a bit of humility in speaking extemporaneously like this, is to meet someone precisely where they're at with presencing the part of themselves in relationship to you that is ready and able and willing to transform itself in a developmental fashion, even in a small way. Like I yeah. want to show up as yeah. who I am yeah. with what I have. And the way into all of these things is so, I mean, it's, it's, it's myriad, it's infinite because it's precisely where that particular unique instantiation of a person is in their life. Yeah. Yet yeah. fundamentally, yeah. we're all going through the same cycles. It's still the theory, theoria dance. It's still yeah. checking in and being there and making sense of where we can together, cultivating a shared space of care and sense, relying on much of what our culture has given us, yet at the same time, drawing in some co-creating some potential together that is joyous in its opening up of the world in that way for well us said. then and there. Um, yeah. John, I'm conscious now that we're coming to, I don't know how long we have left. Um, so I can go a little bit after six to make up for, on my time, uh, a little bit past this scheduled two hours to make up for that gap that we encountered so that you can have a more uh, complete thing. Uh, but let's say uh about another sort of 25 minutes how's that okay beautiful okay excellent okay then so let's let's see how let's see it's you know it's it's an incredible i feel so grateful to have this kind of opportunity and i have worked fairly hard to have this kind of opportunity but there's a thing in dialogue that i feel i'm bringing people together to do this kind of thing and, and contend with deep issues and i would love there's so many beautiful areas of dialogue and places we could go but it almost feels like i've got a special power right now because i can drop in i can drop into myself and draw up a question <laughs> and i can throw it over to you and you've sort of agreed <laughs> to answer it's so hilarious <laughs> you know um yeah it's like the world Wonderful. can open up to me just from doing that and it's it's quite remarkable so so I'm, I'm going to, if you don't mind, take that opportunity to do just that and see in what way we can, uh, we can unleash what you can have to offer. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, this is it. So, hmm. Okay, so there's 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 a there's a few areas of inquiry that have come to mind. First of all, I was really motivated by this notion of joy, and in what sense, mm -hmm. in what sense, we you can create for us here, or or speak to how of how of how or where may be ripe in our creation of a an element or space within culture that can afford a sort of joyful opening of people's expression. And then, you know what came to me, John? I felt the, maybe the, you know, metaphorically, the, the sort of opponent processing of that. And I felt, I felt into a, a, a difficulty and a certain trauma of our time. And, and that is, is going to be a bit of a lateral jump, but it may be somewhat resonant. And th that trauma is mm -hmm. one experienced, I think, by both men and women, by both, by, in a both masculine sense and a feminine sense. But there is a, the, the whole world of Me Too, and just not what Me Too is specifically, mm -hmm. but what it's tapping into in sort of a certain disconnection and in some sense an 
inappropriate kind of relationship and an environment fundamentally of not caring. There's a there's a deep sense in which an interlocking sense of care has not been managed for whatever reason for the psyches of people involved in this mm-hmm. milieu that we find ourselves in. And something I've experienced is that there is a... Um, there's a particular, I don't know, maybe not a particular, but there's a deep sense of a, a a woundedness for both masculine and feminine. But let's maybe concentrate on the, the feminine. Perhaps they have to be taken together. That's crucially important. Um, and I think people don't do that enough, really speak to both masculinity and femininity together. Um, but there's a, there's a, a, a block. There's somehow an environment of safety mm-hmm. that must be cultivated to presence a certain kind of, I would like to say, and it has to be metaphorical, is a, dis- a, a distinctly feminine kind of energy, a feminine kind of vulnerability in certain spaces. For that to be presenced, but not in, not to be looked, for that not to be an exposure, for that presencing not to be seen then as a prey. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's, there has to, yeah, a, yeah, a, no, an enabling yeah, of yeah. that vulnerability because without that and the appropriate relationship therein, men and women seriously playing together you know joy is going to be hampered joy is going to be concerned with whether or not its vulnerable expression is in some sense unsafe so what are your thoughts on that mode of inquiry that's that's very that's very very important um one of the things I try to do is in order to discharge some of the reactivity around the words, I often shift to yin and yang rather than uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, feminine and masculine uh, because those tend to have a more ontological association as, for t- as opposed to the now highly politicized uh, understanding of uh, masculine and feminine. Not that there aren't important political issues. There are. I'm not, I'm not denying the history of feminism or its value. I'm just saying that sometimes it's hard to talk about the things you want to talk about. Uh, I notice how you know, you're, 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 there's trepidation, yeah. uh, how you're moving around these words. Yeah. Um, so the yin and yang aspects to me come in so wonderfully when I move from adversarial pro- an adversarial framing to an opponent processing. And then I see this very much at work in circling, in which I, I, there's men and women in, in the circling, right? Um, and, 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 you know, the, there's all kinds of overly simplistic things. Oh, everybody's the same. That's ridiculous. Being a man, being a woman, that makes a difference. To p- pretend it doesn't is, is pretense. Uh, but also to, to come up with simple, you know, categorizations of what that means is also, that's why, again, I try to use this yin and yang because these, these are much more comprehensive and deep and, you know, multivocal terms, right? And, 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 they're, and, 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 and they're, they, in the Tao, in the symbol of the Tao, they are represented in dynamic relationship and interpenetrating each other with no, with, with no sexual uh, intent meant there. Um, and, and so, I see I see that the people that come into circling and I'm deeply grateful to 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 meet these people and I can even see it within a person like when when guy is doing his thing or when Jordan is doing his thing and I mean that thing with respect right I don't mean it as yeah, dismissive yeah. Um, I like I see there's a deep reverence for the expansion of the yang and the contraction of the yin, uh, the the right the 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 uh, attempt to project of the yang, the attempt to sensitize of the yin, and that and that they're 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 flowing, and you get this sense of they're they're both sort of parametric constraints on the self-organizing process that goes on, and people aren't trying to pin them down or position themselves as representing one of these constraints. Rather, what they want to do is they want to participate as fully as possible if in the rhythm of the process that's taking place within the space that is constituted by the by the constraints. So they're trying to hold the constraints within opponent processing rather than position themselves adversarials as representative of the, uh, of the poles and put them into some kind of competition with each other. Now, I think all of that is very, very important. Um, now, we have to take great care because that 
that that is a very real possibility, and it is a possibility that both the men and the women, I think, in the circling, deeply value. I, I, that's that is my I, I've come. I, I, I have a strong conviction that that's what I'm seeing in 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 the circling. Um, so, are you still there, Tim? Yes, I'm here. I think oh, you froze back. there for a second. Yes. Yeah, you froze. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you hear everything yes. I said about both? Yes. Both the men and women are deeply valued. Okay, and so. I, I want to acknowledge all of that and I want to acknowledge it reverentially and I want to recommend it as something we should be paying more attention to. That instead of positioning and adversarial, we can we can hold the opponent processing and move to the space given by the constraints, right? I want to acknowledge that reverentially while also acknowledging that we have to address all the traumatic damage that's been done by the kind of disconnect uh, you're talking about. Uh, the way in which we... Um, for all kinds of cultural, historical, and psychopathological reasons, have hurt each other around, um, you know, issues of gender and the masculine and the feminine. Um, I, 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 I think, I think, I think what I want to say there is my one criticism about how many people talk about, for lack of a better adjective, and it's not quite the right adjective, but it's one that I'm going to use right now, how people talk about the political aspect of this. The one criticism I have is, it seems to me that the expression of anger and resentment on both sides, or multiple sides, I guess, um, is being prioritized over trying to create a shared goal of bringing about healing mm. from the trauma. And here's how the two points connect together. I think if we recover the yin yang dynamism, that can tell us that it, that healing is really possible and that therefore we should be balancing the needed criticism with the ultimate prioritizing of the goal of healing. Um, and that is not to trivialize or equate everybody's suffering or to do anything simplistic like that, right? I'm not, I'm, I hope I'm not being stupid here in that fashion. But I do think that we are running out of time and we've got to figure out how to more deeply live together and love together and work and play together and develop together if we're going to save things. And so we've got to give my, more priority to the healing. We just have to. There, I mean, I, I don't see a real alternative for all of us together. Yes. 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 And um, the movement, we, not us, in terms of us and them, this how can we yes. be part of this yeah this um, opponent processing is like a, the rhythm i i love the metaphors i speak so much most mostly to open up to, to to people about where i'm where i'm thinking and feeling and and how i'm being in the world is through the metaphor of rhythm and music what i'm finding most yeah. powerful is this notion of the deep drums to tap in and feel into the deep drums that are present, you know, all the noise, all the noise. It is a, it's an innate capacity of all of uh, us to I, tune I like into the metaphor. deep drums. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, I like that metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, I, and I like the, the shamanic associations mm. that it's calling forth. Mm. I think that's, I think that's very wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you. Mm. That's very, I like that metaphor a lot, the deep drums. Yeah. So I think I think uh, you know I, I it worries me because we're you know the adversarial processing is becoming so um, so prominent and such it's being sort of indicated as so me meshed with the only way to have power and influence. Mm -hmm. I do worry about our ability to get back to. Um, the sense of opponent processing. See, it, the to me one of the one of the crucial differences is in opponent processing, and this is again the difference between dialogue and monologue. It's the difference between philia sophia and philia nikea, the love of wisdom versus the love of victory. Mm. Right? Is that 
we, what we should share above both of us always is a commitment to the process as opposed to the victory of whatever position we're advocating. And you see, democracies were supposed to, and they did for a long time, work and people being committed to the process. And the idea that the conflict within, right, the, between the parties was ultimately the best way to embody self-correction, that what we were actually invested in was, because I think the, the ultimate value of democracy is its capacity for self-correction. That's what sets it above the other systems. And I think once it loses self-correction, it becomes what Winston Churchill, I mean, it's the worst to next, Winston Churchill said it's the worst system next to all the rest. But I think if you remove the, the, the commitment to self-correction, then it just simply becomes the worst system, right? And, and, and so I think that you have to have a commitment to the process because of an unwavering understanding and appreciation and reverence for how much self-correction is continually needed by all and therefore why the opponent processing must be respected above and beyond your own particular party and position at all times and when democracies have that i think they function very very well and when we lose that which i think we're losing all around and especially in the sort of the major democracies like the united states and and britain i mean we seem to have lost this capacity uh, for understanding the need by all for self-correction and therefore the commitment to the superlative valuing of the process and the self-correction therein over our particular goals and our particular party and our particular position. Uh, if we, the degree to which the democracies have, have lost that commitment is the degree to which we've entered into very serious trouble. Oh. And I, I think, you know, the fact that it's becoming like, difficult to take a stand above one's party for one's country, how, how difficult that's becoming in the United States. How is, well, I grew up with the Americans being the epitome of patriotism, that Americanism was almost like a secular religion, and now Americanism is dead. And people are going, oh, no, no, no. If you are not committed to the process into the country over your position in your party, Americanism is dead. It is dead, dead, dead. Oh, John, it's it's very, very powerful. There's um, there's 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 something we can presence here that brings this to life in a way that's even in some sense more horrifying which is which is that you know I, I follow english politics quite a lot particularly in this brexit period watching parliament and what have you and yeah. what's what seems to be one of the key markers of a successful politician in this combative sense not in this deep sense my god not in this deep sense is the capacity to perform as if you were extending the hand but you're not extending the hand you're deeply you're you're yeah. you're deeply insinuating that the other side is is not to but be parted with whatsoever subterfuge. yeah and the level of yeah. the level of articulation capacity the boris johnson and um the speak and the uh what's his name um oh i know yeah i can't remember yeah he's extremely posh in his presentation and Wow, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and his capacity to deliver to deliver communication in such a in such a flowing way, he he evokes the sense of the gentleman, in just a, in an incredible incredible degree, and it has me buying into it when he speaks an awful lot, and then there's part of me that it's like, if that if that is really functioning by way of if it's if you you know it, there's just you know through the little sly lines of the communists on the other side or just the a certain kind of derision to to the the the, the energy like it's it's not it's not extending the hand to what is what what is virtuous like what where where the virtue is coming from it you know, sometimes when we are outraged, it may be the case that much of what we're saying 
turns to noise quite quickly. But the very motivation to be presenting something we care about in that performative way, we are being vulnerable with that, that has to be spoken to and heard, right? It has to be heard and, and appreciated. And there's a sense in which just how good at just how good at acting as though we are building bridges but fundamentally not building bridges is is a is a core danger it's the performance of authenticity in that in that deep sense rather than rather than a, a true offering the pretense. Up. yes 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 the pretense yeah I, I i've tried to i've tried to think about that very deeply in a way that would call me to my own personal response. What are the markers that I'm actually entering into dialogue as opposed to ertsatz or pretense? Um, I've tried to look for the degree to which I'm open to an insight from the other. I'm open to acknowledging a good criticism by the other. I'm open to dialoguing with people who, and I do do this, who have ontological religious commitments mm. um, other than mine and trying to, it, it's, for, let me give you a clear example. Jonathan Pajot, who I deeply respect, um, you know, very much a criti criti uh, committed Christian, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, he made a criticism, you know, John's talking about, you know, the, 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 all of these ecologies of practice, but what he tells to talk about is very individualistic and he's leaving, he's leaving out you know, what, what was in the Ecclesia, the gathering together, the collective. And I thought, that's, that's, that's right. I took that criticism, and let's remember what this used to mean. I took that criticism to heart. Mm. That's one of the things that motivated me to take a look at circling, to get involved in these collective psychotechnologies, precisely because, uh, you know, I took Jonathan's criticism Seriously, it was like that. No, that's a very, very good point. I take Paul's criticism about when I'm talking about the religion that's not a religion, about the issues of scalability and you know what do you do that's going to do you know what? How is it going to match up to something like what tradition gave us? I, I take I so there, you know we have to remember, and this goes along with serious play. Between accepting and rejecting, there is the important liminal transformative place of taking seriously. Taking seriously. It doesn't mean, oh, I agree, you're right, or no, you're wrong, or, let's fight about it. It's like, I'm going to take it seriously, and I'm going to try and see what insight is in there, you know, open myself up try as much as I can to self-correction. doesn't mean that I'm going to sort of just give ground because then that's also not of service to the person that I'm in dialogue with, right? But the, this idea, and this is why I, I, I'm doing all this work with Leo Ferraro on plausibility as opposed to certainty, because certainty is about, right, about coming to conclusions, which are very rare to actually uh, 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 to get to. Whereas plausibility, which is so important to the practice of science, is you know, having a sense of we should take this seriously. Mm. We should take this seriously, which that doesn't mean the scientist says that, that's the truth. I've concluded. But the scientist says, no, no, we should take this seriously. <clears throat> a deep part of serious play is what things do you do? What habits, like to use Aristotle, what virtues do you cultivate so that you regularly and reliably show up and take seriously what the other person is saying, right? And so that you, and, and then you can also, you know, encourage them and care them uh, to take you seriously as well. Oh, well, John, you, you embody this and show up with that in, um, with that disposition in such a beautiful way. And I'm deeply appreciative of, of it, both personally and also as someone who cares about how we are making the world together, all of us and the moment at, at, at the moment, you know, I appreciate, I really appreciate how you're showing up and, um, look, I'd, I'd, um, I feel, I feel as though bringing this dialogue to a closure now is, is right. Yeah. Appropriate. Yeah. yeah. It's good. And so, yeah. you know, thank you so much. I, um, I look forward to, 
I look forward to further to further dialogues in the future. Yeah. Well, you you, you can tell how uh, how excited I was when I saw you showing up uh, <laughs> in that. Uh, that yeah. I'm happy to see you, and I'm happy um, to interact with you. Um, I thank you too. I think you bring, um, I think you bring a tremendous depth and flexibility and finesse um, to how you show up and how you engage and how you participate in these dialogues, and um, and you also are so articulate. I, I I would really love to see you talk with Christopher Master Pietro, my dear friend, because his innate capacity, or well, it's both innate and I think highly trained. Um, his innate capacity for l lyrical expression and insightful articulation. I think the two of you would just vibrate off against each other in just a powerful and profound way. Um, so I encourage you to uh, speak with him, but um, I, I think what you bring to this makes it deeply enjoyable in that not so much pleasure, but I experience deep joy in, in, in this time we've shared together. So thank you very, very much for it. I really appreciate it.